Turn to Revelation 19. Um, this chapter is really broken into three sections. We'll look at the first two sections this morning. Uh, the first section deals with praise and alleluia uh, because the, the great uh, horrible system of Babylon has been judged. And then we will look at the marriage supper of the Lamb and what does that mean for all of us? What happens when we get to heaven? And then next time, not next Sunday, because we'll have uh, sunrise service and Easter message here. But then the following Sunday, Lord willing, if we're still here. I didn't think we were going to be here this year. I thought I'd be out of here by now. But uh, so in uh, two weeks, we'll finish up Revelation 19 with the second coming of Christ. And he'll set up his kingdom on earth. And then chapter 20 deals with the millennial reign of Christ on earth. And so great things in store for us. But let's um, open up in chapter 19, verse 1. The Apostle John writes, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. So notice the first thing he says is after these things. So after what things? After the judgment of the whole Babylonian system of wickedness and corruption that we just saw in chapter 17 and 18. Remember in chapter 17, we saw the destruction of the religious system of Babylon. Uh, Babylon was called the mother of harlots, the abominations of the earth. Um, we, we saw that Babylon was the birthplace of all pagan religions and false doctrines, uh, God-rejecting practices. And yet after thousands of years of this pagan system coming against God's people and thousands of years of trying to distort and, and destroy God's word, God will finally destroy and he'll take vengeance upon all those who have um, corrupted God's word, tried to distort God's word, and he will bring judgment against all the false religions and teachings that really were birthed in Babylon and, and they've spread throughout the world. Then we saw in chapter 18, there's a judgment and God destroys uh, what we call material Babylon or commercial Babylon, the whole political system that uh, oversees the things of this world that's wicked and God uh, not God honoring, and, and God will destroy this greedy, sinful, lustful system that uh, we saw they buy and sell everything, even the souls of men and women, boys and girls. And, and so God will judge them. You know, God is really judging the, the pagan God of mammon in this chapter, chapter 18, uh, the God of riches and pleasure, the God of materialism and worldliness. Uh, this is what Jesus states uh, in Matthew 6, 24, and this is for all of us as well. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is a pagan god of pleasure and riches. As I mentioned last time, riches is, a, or you know, wealth, money, it's a good servant, but it makes a horrible master. So make sure that you are in control of the things God has blessed you with and don't let those things control you. And so in chapter 18, we saw that mammon will be the God that most of the world will serve in the last days. I mean, when you look at 2 Peter, or 2 Timothy, I should say, uh, chapter 3, you know, Paul talks about in the last days, men's will be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They, they're lovers of money rather than lovers of God. So it was in chapter 18, verse 20, that all of us in heaven were told to rejoice over God's judgment of Babylon because God has avenged us on her. And so here in chapter 19, verse 1, we see that response of heaven to that call, and we're going to be part of this scene. We're going to be shouting out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. And by the way, this is the first of four times the word Hallelujah is used in this uh, section. 
It's the only times hallelujah is used in the New Testament. It's very common in the Old Testament. It's a transliteration of praise the Lord. Hallel means to praise. Uh, hallelujah is short for Yahweh. So praise the Lord is what it refers to. And it's a glorious word. I mean, it's a word. It's a heavenly word because wherever you go in the world, uh, no matter where Christians are, you, when we're in India and you go to the, all these different tribal groups, they all speak different languages, they'll all say hallelujah. I mean, I can understand that word. That's the only word I can understand them saying, but it's awesome because everywhere, every, Christians throughout the world use this universal word of alleluia. So there's a definite article before each of these words. In other words, it says the salvation, the glory, the honor, the power belongs to the Lord our God. In other words, there's going to be no glory for rock stars, movie stars, sports stars. All glory is going to go to Jesus Christ the Lord. By the way, this will be the final apologetic, as I heard one pastor say. This was the final apologetic. In other words, at this moment, there'll be no debate about any doctrines. I mean, it's all clarified. 100%. We will know exactly who Jesus Christ is. He is God the Son, co-creator of the heavens and the earth. We know these things from the scriptures, but it'll be totally evident because so many people debate all these things, amillennialism, premillennialism. Well, we'll we'll find out for sure it's premillennialism, you know, when it comes to all these doctrines as far as, you know, Calvinism, Arminianism. It's all going to be answered, the final apologetic, when we stand before the Lord and we you know, just shout out hallelujah. All doctrines of who God is, who Jesus Christ is, all that he's done, they're answered once and for all. So, verse 2, we'll say, because this is we're in this group, for true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And so even though the people on earth are going to be weeping and wailing over the destruction of Babylon, we will be rejoicing. Now, again, this is where a lot of people have an issue with the Bible, and some Christians have a hard time understanding the judgments of God. Um, once again, we've been looking at the Great Tribulation, which is the worst time of judgment this world has ever seen. It's a seven-year period that this world has never faced before, and it's going to be destroyed almost to the brink of annihilation with God's wrath. Satan and all the demons are let loose. You've got World War III with Armageddon taking place. It's going to be brutal beyond comprehension. And yet we're praising the Lord for the destruction of this Babylonian system. You know, how can we say hallelujah? Well, it's hard to see it now, but when we get to heaven, our perspective will be totally, radically changed. In other words, what we don't fully understand today will be made clear. And we will have clear understanding because in heaven, we will get the complete picture of God's holiness, his righteousness, his truth. This side of heaven, not so much. This side of heaven, we still question. We still wonder, why do these things happen? Why does that happen? But when we stand before him, well, it'll be perfectly clear that God is perfect in every way. And so today you'll hear people, even some Christians will say, well, if God was so loving, well, why does he allow this to happen? If God was so loving, why does he allow these school shootings? If God is so loving, why does he have these tornadoes go through Arkansas, Mississippi, and people die? If God is so loving, why doesn't he stop these things? But this is why it's so important for us to trust the Lord as we are on this side of heaven. We're in this journey here and now. We might not know why certain things that are painful have happened in our lives or in other people's lives, but... This is why we need to walk by faith in the Lord and not by sight. We always need to fall back on the final authority, which is God's word. And we know that God is loving. He is compassionate. He is full of grace and mercy. We know that Satan hates everything about God. I don't think people give Satan enough credit when bad things happen. But we know that God is ultimately on the throne and he allows certain things to happen. We don't understand why but it's not for us to figure out all the whys. We need to trust that God is perfectly capable and he is in control and he knows what he's doing a lot better than we do because it's during our difficult times that we 
truly see the promises of God from his word come to life within us. That's when we realize the reality of Jesus telling us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And you got to hold on to these things. But I guarantee when we see the Lord in glory, all of our questions and doubts and fears are just going to, in a sense, vaporize in his presence. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Look at these verses, starting in verse 12. And I refer to this verse a lot because this is where I am a lot. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face, talking about when we're in the presence of the Lord. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And so, you know, I know in part. I don't know everything. You don't know everything, but I know the one who does know everything, and that's God. And so now he says, abide, so presently, right now, abide, faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And so in the meantime, before we see the Lord up in heaven in glory, keep abiding, keep walking by faith, keep trusting the Lord, keep holding on to your faith, keep hoping in the Lord that he is with you and he knows what you're going through, he cares about what you're going through, and keep, like Paul says there, abiding in God's love. The greatest of these is love. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that he loved you so much, he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you, for your sins. That's why he came 2,000 years ago, to die. It wasn't just to do a bunch of miracles and live a you know wonderful life. And No, he came for the purpose of being the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he loves you enough to adopt you into his family. He's given you eternal life, and he loves you so much, he's going to bring you to heaven when your life on earth is finished. He's done everything for us, and so he wants us to abide in love. Don't ever lose sight of the love that Jesus has for you. So verse 3, again they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And as we've seen, this is the fate of all those who reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This is the end result of all those who worship the Antichrist during this time. Uh, this is what we look at. Uh, we saw in Revelation 14. Look at these verses once again, starting in verse 9. It says, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, that's the Antichrist, and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, the infamous 666, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends, here it is again, forever and ever." And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and he and who receives the mark of his name. And so it's, it's forever, eternal life, eternal damnation. It's black and white with the Lord. Verse 4, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Uh, again, we saw back in chapters 4 and 5, the 24 elders represent the, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, who have been raptured, who have been rewarded before the great tribulation begins in chapter 6. And just like everyone's response to God's perfect and righteous judgment, we will also proclaim, Amen, Alleluia. There'll be no doubt. Verse 5, Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. So this is the fourth and final shout of Alleluia. And at this moment, we will fully understand 
the Lord our God omnipotent reigns. In other words, we will fully understand and appreciate the sovereignty of God, that he is all-powerful, that he is in total control of the entire universe, from the tiniest cell to the, the massive galaxies out in the universe, he is in control. That's what sovereignty means. And that's why we will shout out hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent, all-powerful reigns. You know, one of the greatest evidences to me that proves the existence of God and that he is a creator of all things is seen in the fact that there is design in creation. And if there is design, even in the smallest DNA, you see those perfectly designed little well, you know, helixes or whatever they're called, you see design in all these things. There must be a designer. You see design in the massive galaxies out there. You, just, you know, these telescopes that zero in on these things and these scopes out in space, and they're zeroing on these you know, faraway galaxies, and just the design of them is just incredible. So if there is a design, there must be a designer. It did not just happen by accident. Our universe is not made up randomly or by billions of years of chance, but we see design in all of creation. Again, from the smallest little DNA to the furthest reaches of the universe, we see the fingerprints of God on everything. This is why Paul says in Romans 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world... Again, if there's a creation, there must be a creator. His invisible attributes, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, the unbelievers, are without excuse. Now, take note there at the end of. Uh, or in the middle there, verse 5, it says, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him. The number one problem in the world today, and the reason we see such horrible things, especially in our country, where they can't even decide what sex they are, and they can't even understand, you know, why is there mass shootings? Why are there, you know, all these wars throughout the world? Why is there so much hatred? And, and why is there abuse of all kinds and, and abortions and, and everything else, political corruption? It's all because of there's no fear of God. That's the bottom line. People don't fear the Lord. They, they, our country does not fear God. If our politicians feared the Lord at all, they would repent. They would stop doing what they're doing, taking all these bribes and everything else. It doesn't matter if they're Democrats or Republicans. They're all corrupt, and they need to get right with God. Otherwise, we're all going to implode in this nation, and we're seeing this drastic fall, I think a free fall in our nation, because we do not have the fear of the Lord in general you know, in our nation and throughout the world. Uh, Psalm 33, 12 says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, or Yahweh. That one's not on the screen. That's uh, Psalm 33, verse 12. Here, this one on the screen, Proverbs 14, 34 says, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Again, that's where we are. We're without excuse as a nation. We've had the gospel preached over and over and over again. We've been saturated with the word of God, and yet most people today are rejecting the word of God. So now here in verse 6, we see all of heaven erupts in praise and worship, and John says that it's so loud, it sounds, it sounds like giant waterfalls. It sounds like you know mighty thunderings, like all at once. I mean, can you imagine how glorious this, this is going to be when billions upon billions of saints... And angels just start to worship God. Hallelujah. Our God omnipotent reigns. And I can guarantee when we get to heaven and we're in this scene here and we're praising God, none of us are going to be standing there with our hands in our pockets jingling our change saying, well, this is boring. You know, this is dull. I wish something else would happen. Are you kidding me? We're, we're going to be so enthralled, so enamored, so blown away by God and being in His presence. We'll all be crying out, Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Our God omnipotent reigns. 
The only way that's possible is we got to get out of these bodies of flesh because these bodies of flesh are the problem today because we're in these bodies of flesh. Even though we're born again, we have a spirit that's alive to the Lord. There's still this ongoing dichotomy between the old man and the new man. They still wrestle back and forth. You know, Paul talks about it in Romans, in Corinthians, in Galatians. You know, there's this warring going on in our bodies and with the flesh and the spirit. So when we're out of these bodies once and for all, then we will be in our new resurrection bodies, and it's going to be glorious. We're not going to have any distractions. We're not going to be thinking about, you know, like me, oh, my, my teams in San Diego State Aztecs, they're in the finals. Woohoo! You're like, big deal, you know. Um, Rockies won two out of three. The Avalanche, I mean, we're so easily distracted by so many things, you know, my... I had two brother-in-laws here this past week. Robert, many of you know Robert from San Diego. And then um, Elizabeth's oldest sister, Helen. Uh, is that the right way to say it? Older sister, Helen. Not oldest. I don't know. Well, her husband, Gus, was here. And we went skiing up at Powderhorn three times. I am sore. But it was amazing. I mean, it was, it was just awesome. But this body can feel it. <laughs> but we're so easily distracted because it's like, Wow, I mean, they're staying open another week. They're supposed to close today, but now they're going to close Easter Sunday, which is kind of weird. But they're staying open all week, and you're thinking, wow, what if the snow's still going to be good? Because usually by the end of March, it's just slush and everything else. Aren't we easily distracted in these bodies? That's why we need our resurrection bodies, and then our minds won't be drifting in all these different directions. But none of us will have these issues when we get to heaven. John says in 1 John 3, Verse 2, the apostle who wrote Revelation writes there, Beloved, now we are children of God. That's our position because we're born again. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. That's good because when I look in the mirror, it's like, wow, this is disappointing. So it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, some of you laughed a little bit too loud when I said that. But we know that when he is revealed, notice, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So in the meantime, even though we can become easily distracted by so many things, keep setting your mind on things above. Keep going back to the word of God. Keep centered on Jesus, uh, you know, like uh, Colossians 3, set your mind on things above where Christ is, not on the things of this earth, because this world is passing away. But we keep looking to the Lord. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. And as we do, we'll be drawn into a deeper, more meaningful relationship with the Lord. And as we do, it's wonderful. It's glorious to see how all these trivial things around us begin to dissipate in our minds as we recognize Jesus is with me, and he loves me, and he's not going to leave me or forsake me. And, and we begin to worship him in spirit and truth. So this will be the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. Not just 6, but 7. Look at these verses. We, we quote these almost every Christmas season. For unto us a child is born... That's from our earthly perspective. Unto us a son is given. That's heaven's perspective. God sent his only begotten son. And the government will be upon his shoulder. We don't yet see that, but he's coming back, as we'll see at the end of this chapter. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Notice of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. So that's what we're looking forward to when he establishes his kingdom. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so we're going to be here in heaven shouting hallelujah. But can you imagine? I mean, I, I think back of, you know, people that have passed on, friends, you know, relatives, the reunions that we're going to have when we get to heaven, 
You know, I'm going to say, Mom, it's going to be awesome to see my mom in heaven. For 70 years, she rebelled against God. And then after my dad passed away, she finally got saved. And they had a great 17 years before the Lord took her home. My aunt, uh, Verna, my uncle George, my dad's brother and his wife, man, I'm going to see them in heaven. I mean, they got saved when they were like 80. And it's going to be awesome. Gary Ryan, some of you remember Gary? He's going to have hair. He was bald as anybody. I mean, it's going to be great. David Maloney. I mean, we're going to see, we're going to have these reunions with people, but also we're going to have a lot of introductions. Can you imagine getting up there and, Jeff, let me introduce you to Abraham. And there's Isaac and Jacob and, you know, hi, I'm the Apostle Paul. Nice to meet you. I mean, it's going to be amazing. These introductions we're going to have when we get to be with the Lord in glory. So, looking forward to this. We're going to be shouting, Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Look at verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. Interesting phrase. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, there are two major events that take place once we get to heaven. Two major events. The first thing that's going to happen is when we get to heaven, we will stand before the Bema seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ. This is only for believers. It's not for unbelievers. They'll stand at the great white throne. But the first thing that happens, we stand before the Bema seat of Christ. And then we will have uh, these, well, we'll talk about it in a moment, the marriage, our final marriage to the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Now, this is a weird phrase where it says, his wife has made herself ready. That's you and I. How does the bride of Christ make herself ready for the wedding? What did we do to qualify as the bride of Christ? Well, as you know, we didn't do anything. The Lord did everything. Only Jesus could pay the price to redeem us from all of our sins. All we could do, and this is where hyper-Calvinists have issues with me, all we could do is put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. They say, well, you can't even do that because that's a work. No, it's not a work. You know, When they ask Jesus, what good work can we do to do the works of God? They said, Jesus tells them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom the Father has sent. That's uh, what John 6, 29. That's all we can do. Believe. John chapter 1, verse 12. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. And we know that Jesus accomplished everything that the Father required to enable lost sinners to be saved. All we could do is believe Him, receive Him as our Lord and Savior. And Jesus is, was, always has been God. And He was God come in human flesh. And as such, Jesus was perfect in every way. He was born perfect. He lived a perfect life. And thus only Jesus qualified to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And again, that price that was paid is the only acceptable price for sin, which was His perfect spotless blood. We couldn't pay that price. It was paid by Jesus Himself. And so Jesus has made us ready. He has saved us. He has you know, made us into new creations. He has taken us from death to life. He's placed His robes of righteousness upon us, and so our salvation belongs to Him alone, and He is worthy of all praise. He alone uh, has declared us righteous. He has imputed to us His very own righteousness. This is what the book of Romans is all about. I mean, that's what Paul's whole thesis in Romans is about. God has done all this for you. He has declared you righteous. He has caused you to be born again. You could not save yourself. And those robes of righteousness are placed on anyone who will put their faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. So, notice this phrase in verse 8. We as the bride of Christ are arrayed in fine linen. 
clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now these linens that are given to us, I don't believe are the robes of righteousness that we received by receiving Christ as Lord and Savior. I think these linens given to us are rewards for the righteous acts we did for the Lord after he saved us. Some look at this as there's two robes. When you get saved, he wraps his robes of righteousness around you. And then as an act, as our sanctification process goes, he gives us as reward these fine linens, bright and clean. Because again, the first thing that all Christians face after the rapture of the church is the Bema Seat of Christ, the judgment seat. This is where we will be rewarded for the things we did for God in the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's also the time and place that everything we did as Christians that were not done in the power of the Holy Spirit will be burned away like chaff and burned away like dross you know it'll just be consumed in the refiner's fire anything we've done with wrong motives selfish pride it's going to be burned up and be a pile of ashes this is what we read second corinthians 5 verse 10 apostle paul writes for we must all appear we here is referring to the body of christ we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that's the Bema seat, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Uh, again, the Bema seat is the place where the athletes were rewarded in the games. When they had the Olympic Games in Greece, this is when it started back then, they would stand before the reward seat, the Bema seat. That's where they were given rewards for winning the race or whatever event they were in only you can say it this way only winners <laughs> will stand before the bema seat of christ uh, paul says we are more than conquerors through him who loves us right romans eight thirty seven. yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us so we will all stand at the bema seat again the unrighteous, all who have rejected God throughout the centuries, throughout the millennial, will be raised before the judgment throne, the great white throne of God. That's in chapter 20. But as followers of Christ, we will receive rewards for what we did in the power of the Holy Spirit, but we will not be rewarded for things we've done with wrong motives. This is how Paul uh, lays it out very clearly in 1 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 10. Look at these verses. According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid a foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw... Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test each one's work, of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. So anything you've done as a Christian in the power of the Holy Spirit, he's going to reward you for because we know, and it's crazy because it's like I don't deserve any rewards. He's going to give us crowns. What do we do with those crowns? We already saw it back in chapter four and five. We'll cast those crowns at his feet because we know he alone is worthy. But he's going to reward us for the things we've done in the spirit. He says, if anyone's work is burned, this is this is the wood, hay, and straw, the things I've done in the flesh as a Christian. It says, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So again, this is only for the bride of Christ, you and me. So that's the first thing that happens when we are caught up into heaven and we receive fine linen, which is the righteous acts of the saints. And then the second thing that we'll look at here is we are now going to be married to the Lord. After that, the marriage takes place. The marriage, in a sense, don't think of it in a weird way, is consummated at this time. And then we will come back with the Lord as the bride of Christ. But take a look at this in verse 9. It says, Then 
he said to me, whoops, and, and then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. So we have to look at this in greater detail because we here we have the wedding feast mentioned, the marriage supper. This is like the reception after the wedding has been you know, done and it's official. And then you would have the wedding reception. That's the reference here. But to get a clear picture of this, you got to review what an ancient Hebrew wedding looked like. There were basically four, some say three, but I see four parts to or stages of a Hebrew wedding. And this is very important to see this in context. Um, we see these stages pictured for us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The first stage was the arrangement for the wedding. It was prearranged by the fathers. Usually they'd have a son, the other couple would have a daughter, and they would prearrange even at three or four years old. When they become of age, these two will get married. They, you know, have a deal. They'd shake hands or they'd say, oh, yep, this is what's going to happen. And so they'll get married down the road. So it was prearranged. Well, we see this prearrangement with Jesus and his bride. We, we see this in verses like Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, Notice, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, and this is a reference to marriage, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And so God the Father has had this wedding planned out for a very long time, so it was prearranged. But then, about a year before the actual wedding took place, the Hebrews would have what they called a betrothal or a spousal period. It was about a year before the actual wedding, and it's similar to our engagement time, but unlike our engagement time where you can break off an engagement at any time before the wedding, that was legally binding. In other words, when you were betrothed a year before the actual wedding, it was like you were legally married, but you could not live together. You could not sleep together. That was forbidden. It was during this espousal period, it was very, very important that they stayed clean and pure, you know, could not get together, could not be consummated until the actual wedding day. But that's the second phase, was the espousal or betrothal period. Now, the only way you could have that espousal period broken was if one of the, you know, the young gal, the young guy, if one of them died, or if one of them committed adultery, it was considered adultery if they were in this espousal period, then they could break off that wedding. That was the only two reasons why you'd break it off. Now, we know what happened with Joseph and Mary. Um, they were in the espousal betrothal period, and it says before they'd come together as husband and wife, they were espoused, and that's when Mary finds out because the Holy Spirit came upon her. She's now pregnant, and Joseph is, you know, when he finds out, he freaks out, wants to put her away secretly because he knows she could be stoned to death because she has been guilty of adultery. But this is why the Lord had to intervene on his behalf. So in Matthew 1.18, we'll look at a couple verses. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was, noticed betrothed to Joseph, before they came together for the actual wedding date, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. So again, he finds out and he's, I got to put you away secretly because he loved her. He didn't want to see her put to death. And so he's going to try to quietly divorce Mary, but then the angel shows up and explains to him, no, she's actually a virgin. This happened by the Holy Spirit coming upon her. And then he tells Joseph in Matthew 121, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. How does this relate to you and I as the bride of Christ? We're called the bride of Christ, but we right now are in this betrothal period. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you, there's the word betrothed, to one husband, 
that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And so we are currently betrothed to Jesus. This is why it's so important that we avoid all forms of sexual immorality. This is why we're told that only the marriage bed is sacred unto the Lord. This is the only time God endorses and blesses that sacred union. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Now, another part of this time frame of the betrothal was, according to the Talmud, there would be a dowry paid by the groom-to-be to the father of the bride-to-be. And that dowry could be you know, money, it could be three cows. You know, what was she worth to him? You know, and then, like, what's your daughter worth? Well, I'll take three cows for her. Does Jesus look at you as a three-cow wife? No. <laughs> well, he, he paid the ultimate price, the ultimate dowry for you and me. What was that? Again, his blood. Look at um, you know, First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but, so you know, this is the dowry price. He didn't give you silver or gold, you know, to buy you, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Glorious. So the betrothal was the second phase of the marriage. Now, again, from God's standpoint, our marriage to Jesus is a done deal. This is why verses like Philippians 1.6 tells us, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun this good work in you will complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. That's completed when we get to heaven and we go through the stand at the bema seat, everything's purged out, we're standing before him, and now we're going to be married to him. That'll be completed. And that brings us to the third phase, often referred to as the presentation. This is when the young couple were ready to be married. And it would begin by, you know, the father saying, now is the time to go get your bride. And, and you know, remember the parable of the ten virgins, five wise, five unwise. Because the, the son could show up at any time that, you know, brought groom-to-be would show up at any time for his bride so they had to be ready and so we need to be watching we need to be ready and the custom varied but often the girl's father would place the, the the daughter's hand in the father of the son and then the father of the son would place his her hand in the, his son's hand and that was the marriage they didn't have any big elaborate ceremonies like we do it would just be the 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 bride's father would take her hand put it in the father's hand and then the father takes her hand and puts it in his son's hand and now they're married pretty simple we see this beautiful presentation in ephesians 5 starting in verse 25 it says husbands love your wives just as christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word notice and these are all wedding terms that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That was referring to the, 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 the I'm getting in trouble here. That was referring to the, after the marriage was consummated, the groom would bring out the sheets and say, see, she was a virgin. That's an easy way to say it. So without having, you know, he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now, again, the, this presentation of the Lord's bride coincides with the rapture of the church. You know, this is what we read. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. That's when he comes for his bride and he's going to take us up to heaven. And, um, but this also, what was he doing in the meantime? So 
in a Hebrew marriage, when he knew we're betrothed, now what am I going to do for her? I'm going to add a room onto my father's house. Because that's what they did in the Hebrew culture. When that couple got married, they would have their own room, but it was attached to the father's house. So what do we read? John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. It says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so what a glorious honeymoon suite Jesus is preparing for you and I, his bride. Now, they would go into that suite, into that added room, and they would stay there for up to seven days. That's when the marriage was consummated. That's where the bride would never leave that chamber. The groom would come out and, you know, bring food and, and drink back to his bride. But they never, that was the honeymoon. That's probably the only time in their life where they didn't, you know, have to work for those seven days. They were in that honeymoon. Amazing. They couldn't go off on a you know Mediterranean cruise. They couldn't fly to you know Maui or somewhere, but they would stay in that room together, and they didn't have to work. It was just a joyous time. Well, Jesus is preparing a place for us. And by the way, when we get there, how long are we going to be there? Seven years, not seven days, but seven years. While all this stuff is happening here, we're going to be enjoying our relationship with the Lord. Then comes the fourth phase of the Hebrew wedding. After the betrothal comes the presentation, and the marriage is official. It's been consummated. And then the couple would come out of their wedding chamber together, and then they would be presented. Don't get confused with presentation, but then they would be presented to all the guests that were invited. That's what refers to here in chapter 19, verse 9. They're coming out of the wedding chamber. They're being presented to all the invited guests. Remember John the Baptist? I'm, you know, just the best man at the wedding. So all the Old Testament saints, they'll be raised up at this time. All the tribulation saints will make it through. All those who survived the Great Tribulation. We're going to come back to earth, and the wedding feast, I believe, will take place here on earth for a thousand years. It's going to be glorious. Now, it's been consummated. The two become one. You know, that's what God says to Adam and Eve. The two become one. Uh, Jesus confirms that in Matthew 19. The two become one. Paul says the exact same thing. Ephesians 5.31. Look at this verse. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. And then Paul adds, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. That's why I believe that the marriage supper, the wedding feast, will actually take place during the millennial reign of Christ upon the earth. It's going to, I think it's going to last the entire thousand years when Jesus rules and reigns, and it says we'll be ruling and reigning with him. So a glorious time this will be. And then in verse 11, skip ahead, we're not going to go here, but I just want to read verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse... And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And then it says in uh, verse 14, And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. That's the bride of Christ. Fine linen, bright and clean. White and clean. We're coming out. That's the presentation of here. Coming back with our groom the bride of Christ, returning to earth, and he's going to set up his kingdom, and it's going to be glorious. That's what we'll look at, Lord willing, next time. But we'll end with verse 10. Look at verse 10. Can you imagine John? I mean, I can't imagine, but can you imagine John standing there? You know, he's caught up into heaven in chapter 4, verse 1. He sees all this stuff in heaven, and he's here, and he's shouting, Hallelujah! He's witnessed all the destruction during the Great Tribulation and the judgment on Babylon, the spiritual Babylon, Babylon, the, you know, the worldly system, and they're all shouting, Hallelujah! And, and the marriage taking place, and he's witnessing all this, and then he does something really foolish. He says, And I fell at his feet, who's showing him all this stuff? An angel 
So he falls at the feet of this angel to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, we should all know by now we don't worship anything or anyone, no created thing, no created being, but we do worship Jesus because he is not a created being. He is God the Son, and we see Jesus being worshipped over and over again throughout the New Testament. But also here, all prophecy points to Jesus. What is prophecy? The definition of prophecy is speaking forth the truth of God's word. So everything about God's word points us to Jesus Christ. Jesus, and this all end with this, in John chapter 5, verse 39, he's speaking to the religious leaders in Israel. And he tells them, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the word of God always points us to Jesus. If you don't see Jesus in the scriptures when you go through the word of God, then you're missing out because Jesus is all throughout the scriptures. We should all want what is after these things because that's what we're looking at here, after these things. Because after these things, this is when in a sense, real life begins in the presence of Jesus, seeing him face to face, being in our resurrection bodies, no longer subject to any kind of pain, sickness, disease, death. It's all swallowed up in the victory of Jesus. But in the meantime, because you are and I am betrothed to him as a chaste virgin, live your life for Jesus, not for the things of this world that are passing away. Don't get caught up in all these things that the world says. You should be living your best life now. Or, you know, go for the gusto. It doesn't get any better than this. Are you kidding me? It's so short-sighted. Live for Jesus. It'll be worth it when you stand before him and you have a little pile of ashes, not a big giant pile of ashes. I don't want any of us to have a giant pile of ashes because we've done stupid things in our flesh. Mm -hmm.